Good morning, Miss Wolf's class. The book we're going to start today is called Christmas in Camelot. Chapter 1 Royal Invitation. Sunlight had faded from the late afternoon sky. Puffy snow clouds were moving in. Let's hurry, I'm cold, said Jack. He and Han Annie were walking home from school. Their Christmas vacation was just beginning. Cuckoo! Wait, said Annie, look. She pointed to a white bird sitting on a bare tree branch at the edge of the woods. The bird was staring straight at them. It's a dove, said Jack. It's a messenger, said Annie, from Morgan. No, Jack said, afraid to let his hopes up. They hadn't seen Morgan in a long time. He really missed her. Yes, said Annie. She has a mission for us. I can feel it. In the hush of the cold twilight, the dove spread its wings and flew into Frog Creek Woods. Come on, said Annie, the treehouse is back. You're just hoping, said Jack. I'm knowing, said Annie. She ran into the woods following the white dove. Oh, brother, said Jack, but he took off after Annie. In the growing darkness, they easily found their way. They zigzagged between the bare trees and ran over the frozen ground until they came to the tallest oak in the woods. See, said Annie, pointing to the top of the tree. Yeah, whispered Jack. There it was, the magic tree house. Morgan, shouted Annie. Jack held his breath, waiting to see the entrances at the tree house window, but Morgan did not appear. Annie grabbed the rope ladder and started up. Jack followed. When they climbed inside the treehouse, Jack saw something lying on the floor. It was a scroll, rolled up and tied with a red velvet ribbon. Jack picked up the scroll and unrolled it. The thick yellowed paper shimmered with large gold writing. Wow, Morgan sent us a really fancy note, said Annie. It's an invitation, said Jack. Listen. Dear Jack and Annie, Please accept this royal invitation to spend Christmas in the kingdom of Cam Camelot. Signed, M. Christmas in Camelot, said Annie. I don't believe it. Cool, whispered Jack. He pictured a beautiful glowing castle lit with candles and filled with knights and ladies feasting and singing. We're going to celebrate Christmas with Morgan and King Arthur, said Annie, and Queen Guinevere. Yeah, said Annie, said Jack, and the knights of the round table like Sir Lancelot. Let's go, said Annie. Where's the book? She and Jack looked around the treehouse for a book about Camelot. The only book they saw was the Pennsylvania book that always brought them home. That's strange, said Jack. Morgan didn't send a book about Camelot with the royal invitation. How does she expect us to get there? I don't know, said Annie. Maybe she forgot. Jack picked up the invitation. He read it again. He turned it over, hoping to find more information. The back of the scroll was blank. He handed the invitation to Annie. She must have forgotten, he said. Darn, said Annie, staring at the gold writing. I really wish we could go to Camelot. The tree branches rustled. The wind began to blow. What's happening, said Jack. I don't know, said Annie. Wait a minute, said Jack. You were holding the invitation and you made a wish. The wind blew harder. That must have made the magic work, said Annie. Jack felt a surge of joy. We're going to Camelot, he said. The treehouse started to spin. It spun faster and faster. Then everything was still 
absolutely still. Chapter 2. This is Camelot. Jack shivered. He could see his breath in the dim light. Annie was staring out the window. This is Camelot, she said. He looked out with her. The tree house had landed in a grove of, tree, of tall bare trees. A huge dark cut castle loomed against the gray sky. No light shone from the windows. No banners waved from the turrets. The wind whistled through its tall towers, sounding sad and lonely. It looks de deserted, said Annie. Yeah, said Jack. I hope we came to the right place. He pulled his notebook and pencil out of the pack. He wanted to write a description of the dark castle. Hey, I see someone, said Annie. Jack looked out the window again. A woman was crossing the castle drawbridge. She wore a long cloak and carried a lantern. Her white hair blew in the wind. Morgan, said Annie and Jack together. They laughed with relief. Morgan hurried over to the frost-covered ground towards the grove of trees. Annie, Jack, is that you, she called. Of course. Who'd you think, shouted Annie. She started down from the treehouse. Jack threw his notebook into his backpack. He followed Annie down the rope ladder. When they reached the icy ground, they ran to Morgan and both threw their arms around her. I was looking out the window in the castle and saw a bright flash in the orchard, said Morgan. What are you doing here? You didn't send the treehouse for us, asked Jack. With a royal invitation to spend Christmas in Camelot, asked Annie. No, said Morgan. She sounded alarmed. But the invitation was signed with an M. I don't understand, said Morgan. We're not celebrating Christmas in Camelot this year. You aren't, said Jack. Why not, asked Annie. A look of sadness crossed Morgan's face. Do you remember when you visited my library and gave King Arthur the hope and courage to challenge his enemy, she, she asked? Sure, said Jack. <clears throat> Well, Arthur's enemy was a man named Mordred, said Morgan. After you left, Arthur defeated him, but not before his dark wizard cast a spell over the whole kingdom. The spell robbed Camelot of all its joy. What? All its joy, whispered Annie. Yes, said Morgan. For months, Camelot has been without music, without celebration, and without laughter. Oh, no, said Annie. What can we do to help, asked Jack. Morgan smiled sadly. This time, I don't think you can do anything, she said. But perhaps it will lift Arthur's spirits to see you both again. Come, let's go inside the castle. Morgan held up her lantern and started towards the drawbridge. Jack and Annie hurried after her. As they walked through the outer courtyard, the frozen grass crackled under their sneakers. They followed Morgan over the bridge and through a tall gate. There were no signs of life in the castle's inner courtyard. Where is everyone? Annie whispered to Jack. I don't know, he whispered back. Jack really wished they had a book about Camelot. It might help them understand what was going on. Morgan led them to a huge archway with two wooden doors. She stopped and looked at them. I'm afraid no book would help you tonight, Jack, she said. Jack was startled that Morgan could read his thoughts. Why not, asked Annie. All of your other visits, journeys, you visit, visited real places and times in history, said Morgan. Camelot is different. How, asked Jack. The story of Camelot is a legend, said Morgan. A legend is a story that begins in truth, but then imagination takes over. Different people in different times tell the story. They use their imaginations to add new parts. 
That is how a legend is kept alive. Tonight we'll add our part, said Annie. Yes, said Morgan, and please, I beg you. In the lantern light, she looked very serious. Do not let the story of Camelot end forever. Keep our kingdom alive. Of course we will, said Annie. Good, Morgan said. Come then. Let's go into the great hall and see the king. Morgan lifted an iron latch and pushed open the heavy doors. Jack and Annie followed her into the dark castle. Chapter 3 The Knights of the Round Table A pair of torches dimly lit the drafty entrance hall of the castle. Shadows danced on the worn tapestry. Wait here, said Morgan. I will tell the king of your arrival. She headed through the huge stone archways that led to the great hall. Let's peek in, Annie said to Jack. Jack pushed his glasses into place. He and Annie walked quietly over the big arch and peered in. The ceiling of the great hall towered high above a stone floor. At the far end of the room, King Arthur and his knights were sitting around a huge round table. They all wore brown tunics. They had shaggy hair and beards. Their names were carved in gold letters on the back of the, their chairs. The knights of the round table, whispered Jack. Morgan was talking to King Arthur. Beside the king sat a woman in a plain gray robe. She had pale skin and brown curly hair. Queen Guinevere, whispered Annie. Morgan left the king and Jack and Annie moved quickly back into the shadows. A moment later, Morgan appeared. I told the king that his special friends of his had just arrived. She said, come with me. As they walked with Morgan through the great hall, Jack shivered. The huge room was drafty and damp. There was no fire in the fireplace. The stone floor was so cold that Jack's feet could feel, feel the chill through his sneakers. They stopped near the red round table. King Arthur stared at them with his piercing gray eyes. Greetings from Frog Creek, Annie said to the king and queen. Annie bowed and Jack bowed too. The queen smiled, but King Arthur did not. Your majesty, you remember Jack and Annie, said Morgan. You met them last summer in my library. Indeed, I shall never forget them, King Arthur said softly. Greetings, Annie, greetings, Jack. How do you come to be in Camelot on this bleak night? We came in the magic treehouse, said Annie. A shadow crossed the king's face. He looked at Morgan. No, your majesty, I did not use my magic to bring them here, she said. Perhaps a little of the magic still lingers in the treehouse and it traveled on its own. What's going on, Jack wondered. Why does King Arthur seem unhappy about the magic treehouse? Arthur looked back at Jack and Annie. However, you may have come. You are welcome in my kingdom, he said. He turned to the queen, Guinevere. These are the two friends who once gave me hope and courage in a time of need. Queen Guinevere smiled again, but there was a sad look in her eye. I have heard much about you, she said. I've heard about you too, said Annie. Allow me to present my knights, said King Arthur. Sir Bowes, Sir Kay, Sir Tristram. As the king named each knight, Jack and Annie nodded shyly. The king nodded, the knights nodded at them in return. Jack waited to hear the name Sir Lancelot, the most famous of Camelot knights, but the king never said it. And finally, Sir Belvedere and Sir Gawain, King Arthur said. The king then turned to three empty chairs at the table. 
And there once sat three who are lost to us now, he said. Lost? How, wondered Jack. You may sit in their places and join us for dinner, King Arthur said. Thank you, said Annie. Following Morgan around the table, Jack read the names carved on the back of the three empty chairs. Sir Lancelot, Sir Gal Galahad, and Sir Percival. Jack took off his backpack and sat down in S Sir Lancelot's place. As he sat tall and straight in the heavy wooden chair, Jack looked at the king and his knights. They were gnawing meat off bones and slurping wine from heavy goblets. They ate without manners or delight. Jack really wanted to take notes. <clears throat> he reached into his pack under the table and pulled out his notebook and pencil. <clears throat> but before he could write a word, a serving boy brought more food. Jack Lee quickly put his things away. The boy set a slab of greasy beef on a soggy piece of bread in front of him. The food looked terrible. Not much of a Christmas feast, huh? Annie said in a low voice. Jack shook his head. Annie leaned down to Morgan and whispered to Sir Arthur, so, as so Sir Arthur wouldn't hear. What happened to the three lost knights? She asked. After Mordred, dark wizard, cast a spell, the king sought help from the magicians of Camelot. They told him he must send his knights on a quest to the other world to recapture the, our kingdom's joy. What's the other word, world, said Jack. It's an ancient in enchanted land beyond the edge of earth, said Morgan, the place where all the magic first begins. Wow, whispered Annie. <clears throat> the king chose his three bravest knights to journey there. When they did not come back, Arthur turned against his magicians. He blamed magic for all of Camelot's woes. Hence, he has banned magic of any kind from the kingdom forever. But you're a magician, whispered Annie. Did the king turn against you too? Arthur and I have a long friendship, said Morgan. He has allowed me to stay in the castle as long as I promise not to practice the art of magic ever again. A feeling of dread crept over Jack. So does that mean the magic tri treehouse is? Morgan nodded. Yes, banished from Camelot, she said. I'm afraid this will be your last journey and the last time we can see each other. Her eyes filled with tears. She looked away. What? The last time we can see each other? Forever? said Annie. Before Morgan could answer, the wooden door swung open with a bang. A wind rushed through the great hall. Torches and candles flamed brighter, making the shadows leap wildly on the walls. The sound of hoofbeats filled the room. A knight on a huge horse rode through the arched doorway. The knight was dressed all in red, from his shining helmet to the long cloak on his back. His horse was dressed all in green, from the armor that covered his head to the cloth that hung from his saddle. Oh, wow, breathed Annie, a Christmas knight. Chapter four, who will go? I have come to see Arthur the king, the Christmas knight said. His deep voice echoed from inside his helmet. His red armor gleamed in the firelight. King Arthur stood up. He stared fiercely at the knight, and but he spoke in a calm, steady voice. I am Arthur the king, he said. Who are you? The knight didn't answer Arthur's question. So, you are the legendary King Arthur of Camelot, he said in a mocking tone. And these must be the famous Knights of the Round Table. Yes, said King Arthur, and again I asked, who are you? The Christmas Knight still did not answer Arthur's question. The spell of the Dark Wizard has robbed Camelot of its jo joy, said the Christmas Knight. Has it robbed you and your men of your courage as well? You dare to question our courage? King Arthur said in a low, angry voice.
Camelot is dying, the Christmas night boomed. Why has no one journeyed to the other world to replace its joy? I have sent my best knights on such a quest, said King Arthur. They never returned. Then send more, thundered the Christmas knight. No, shouted, shouted King Arthur, pounding his fist on the table. Never again will I feel good, will I feed good men to the magic and monsters of the other world. Jack felt a chill of fear. What monsters? Then you choose your fate, said the Christmas knight. If you will send no one else to the other world, all that your kingdom has gained through time, all the beauty, music, wonder, and light, all that Camelot has ever been or could ever be, will be lost and forgotten forever. No, shouted Annie. Shh. Annie, said Jack. The Christmas night turned to the knights of the table. Who will go, he boomed. We will, shouted Annie. We will, said Jack. Yes, we'll go on the quest, Annie yelled. And she jumped up. No, cried Morgan. Never, said King Arthur. Annie, said Jack. He leapt up from the chair and tried to grab her. Yes, thundered the Christmas night. He pointed his red glove at Jack and Annie. The youngest of all, these two, they will go. You are mocking us, King Arthur shouted. They will go, boomed the knight. His words echoed throughout the hall. Oh no, thought Jack. Yes, said Annie. She pulled Jack towards the Christmas night. King Arthur turned to his men. Stop them. Several knights started to rush towards Jack and Annie. The Christmas knight raised his gloved hand high in the air. In an instant, the room fell deathly quiet. Everyone around the table was as still as a statue. Arthur looked like the statue of a furious king. Queen Guinevere looked like the statue of a worried queen. The knights of the round table looked like statues of fierce knights. And Morgan looked like the statue of a caring friend. Her mouth was open as if she were calling out to Jack and Annie, but no sound came from her lips. No sound at all. Chapter five. Rhymes of the Christmas night. <clears throat> Morgan said Annie. Annie ran to the table. She touched Morgan's cheek, then quickly pulled back her hand. She's cold. She's as cold as ice, said Annie. Tears filled her eyes. Annie turned to the Christmas night in fury. What did you do to Morgan, she asked. Bring her back. Do not fear, said the Christmas night. His voice was softer and kinder. She will come back to life after you complete your quest. What, what exactly is our quest, said Jack. You must journey to the other world, said the Christmas night. There you will find a cauldron. The cauldron is filled with the water of memory and imagination. You must bring a cup of the water back to Camelot. If you fail, Camelot will never come back to life. Never. How do we do that? asked Annie, wiping her eyes. Remember these three rhymes, said the Christmas night. Wait, let me write them down, said Jack. His hands trembled as he pulled out his notebook and pencil. He looked at the Christmas night. Okay, I'm ready, he said, gripping his pen pencil. Made Jack feel stronger. The knight's voice rang out from inside his helmet. Beyond the iron gate, the keepers of the cauldron wait. Jack quickly wrote down the knight's words. Okay, what's next, he said. The Christmas night went on. Four gifts you will need, the first from me, then a cup, a compass, and finally a key. Cup, compass, key. Got it, he said. If you, The Christmas night's voice boomed. If you survive to complete your quest, the secret door lies to the west. Jack copied down the last rhyme, then looked up at the knight. Anything else, he asked. Without a word, the knight pulled off his red cloak. He dropped it on the floor. 
it fell silently into a heap at Jack and Annie's feet. The Christmas night snapped his horse's red reins, then galloped out of the great hall. Okay, we will continue with chapter six tomorrow.